Thanks, Richard. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, given the magnitude of the issues, I appreciate you giving me 45 minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about the juvenile system and the adult system and how people navigate through it. And I think that uh, we, Bob and I have spoken and said that in, in a lot of ways, most people weren't really kind of familiar with how these systems are set up and how they operate. So we don't want to go through the system entirely, but we want to highlight some points about them that you kind of have to have as context to understand what it means to these systems to have people go through them and to, and to grow up in them. So let me just go through some current issues in juvenile justice. Juvenile justice is basically a sorting system, okay? We have no thing that says well-being. You know, you have to do well-being. We say find the right people, get them out, and if they don't come back, that's a success, okay? So that's really, that's really what we're trying to do. At the front end, we're trying to divert, and then you try to pick the right cases that are, that are serious enough or complicated enough or keep coming back enough that go farther and farther into the system. But it's largely a sorting system. It's, it's a system that recognizes that continued deep penetration into the system is potentially harmful to a child, and, and you, you oftentimes have to have a number of kids go through. But basically, the idea is to get kids out and get the right kids out, OK? The thing that's happened recently is a, a focus on developmental framework. Um, the, the system has become much more attuned to where adolescents are at, what their needs are, how they're different than adults, what they might need at different times, and the importance of accountability and, and how kids have to be held accountable. That doesn't mean they have to be locked up, but it means they have to be held accountable. And, and this is something the system is always grappling with. The other thing is there's been big advances in identification and diversion because of this sorting. The system has become uh, much more uh, systematic uh, in their identification of kids with mental health disorders. They've, they've used much more structured assessments. They've used risk assessments. And I should mention, in, in when we say risk, when you're talking the justice system, we don't mean risk for bad outcomes. We mean risk for reoffending, usually. That's what, when people talk about risk, that's what they mean. So, uh, so there's been a lot more uh, systematic approach to these issues. However, there's still a large reliance on institutional care in this system. I think that you will see, uh, and I'll, I'll go through some figures on this later, that uh, the, the, the system still operates to move a large number of kids insta into institutional care. The other major change is there also has been a big push for evidence-based practice and accountability in the system. Uh, it, it's uh, become the, the buzzword in, in juvenile justice, you know, to use evidence-based practice as it has in just about every, every place we've probably been in the last five years. And the thing that always is the, one of the toughest ones to handle and is a continuing issue is this disproportionate minority contact, this over-representation of minority kids in the system. The farther you go into the system, the more representation you get. And the summary of that is usually most of it starts up front. Most of it starts at arrest and detention. And then if you look through the system, it isn't that disproportionate, really, when you get to trying a case and, and placing a kid and that sort of thing. But the kids coming in the front end are disproportionately minority kids. So how do you attack that problem? There's been a lot of work on that, but it's a continuing issue uh, in juvenile justice. So that's kind of the current state of where we're at with juvenile justice. Now, the adult criminal justice system, a little different picture. Now, the adult criminal justice, I'm talking about after 18. So a lot of states maintain jurisdiction over kids past 18. They take them up until 21, and you can retain jurisdiction. If they do something on, three days after their 18th birthday, they're going to the adult system. If, if not, if you've got them in the system and you've got them in an institution somewhere, and you say, I'm not putting this kid back on the street, in many states you can keep them until they're 21, okay? Uh, and the thing in adult criminal justice, the overriding system that Richard had alluded to is ma what's called mass incarceration. And we just lock up a lot of people. We're the leading incarcerating nation in the world, okay? And to see how this has changed, this is the incarceration rate over a number of years. And this is, this is norm to the population. This isn't just the number of people we have locked up. We have, what would we say, Bob, 2.5 million people or something? 2.3 million people locked up. This is the rate by population, and you can see since about 1984 or 83, it's gone up like four or five times, okay? So, so we're just, we're locking up an, an immense number of people. How this comes back down is the big challenge for adult criminal justice system. There's only two ways. You either keep them from coming in the front end, or you get them out the back end faster, or you keep them shorter. I mean, there's, that's the only way you're gonna cut this, and I don't see legislators uh, appealing to the public to, to go easier on their minimums and maximums that they've been campaigning on for years. So the system is basically confronted with the idea of how do we trim this population. And the cost is immense. We won't even go into the cost issues. 
So this is the context, is mass incarceration. That leads to a real focus in, in adult uh, criminal justice on reentry. You know, what do we do? What's the process of reentry? How do we get them back? That brings us to the young adults, because many of these are young adults who are in the system, okay? And there's also a push to, to look at risk, need, responsivity. This is kind of the mantra in, in uh, adult systems now about assessing the risk. What are the criminogenic risks this individual has? What are the needs they have to keep from uh, fueling those risks? And how responsive are they to interventions? And this is the sort of the orienting principle in, a, in adult uh, interventions these days. Okay. These are age crime curves. If people haven't seen these, they probably haven't been alive for a while. But you just see the, uh, you can see that it's, a, you know, crime is the province of the young, right? And although the crime has dropped, you can see the levels of these graphs for the different years has dropped, it is still uh, mostly people above 20. The interesting thing is this rapid drop off that we know very little about, and that's our young adult period where many of the kids stop offending as much, or at least stop getting as arrested as much. So we, we talk about that as desistance, although it's not a real word. It was made up by social scientists. So there's little work on pathways out of the justice system during adolescence and young adulthood. We just don't know much about how those kids get out of there. So um, uh, there are obviously some factors to consider that we've talked about earlier today. They have to do with individual maturation. Kids get less impulsive. You know, we all have stories of people we knew or ourselves and how stupid we were when we were younger and how we got smarter. And then there, we've talked also about a lot of the, the regular life changes that occur, peers changing groups, moving, that sort of thing. But for these kids in particular, in juvenile justice, we also have systems involvement. Th these kids aren't, aren't left alone. They're either put on probation, they're sent to institutions, things are done to them or for them. You know, the line is where that line two and four uh, exists. Um, I'm going to present a little data from a study we've done following 1,354 serious adolescent offenders. I'm, I'm one of a group of 10 people who have done this, and I'm presenting it for that group, so these, this is not all my work. I just want that to be clear. We followed those kids up for seven years, uh, and, and these are felony offending kids. So these have, kids have all been found guilty of a felony offense in Philadelphia or in Phoenix. So their average age 16 when they come in, they're, they're 24 uh, when we stop collecting data. Uh, we do regular interviews and pull all the official records uh, on these kids. So a first, first lesson that we come to out of a lot of this and other literature is most adolescents greatly reduce or stop criminal offending. I mean, this, is, this has been seen before, and, and it's just kind of hard to realize, you know, because you kind of think, well, if they start and they start, oh, my God, they're doing felonies, you know, at age 16. They're going to be doing X, Y at age 23. And the other thing is that even at the deep end, when we're looking at these felony offending kids in metropolitan areas, there's a lot of variability in these kids. And I think this is a, a theme that resonates with a lot of other things that have been said already, that, that this is an important takeaway lesson. And I mentioned the, the, the change in offending. This is simply the uh, rate of rearrests in each wave. In other words, the number of rearrests divided by the amount of time the kid was on the street. We know how long the kid was on the street in each of these years. So, they're on the street longer with less, less likelihood of being arrested, okay? So the mean rate is dropping off over time, and the mean severity is dropping off over time. That y-axis is a scale from one to eight of seriousness of crime, and those dots are, for each of those 84 months, for those seven years, those dots are the medians. It means 50% of the crimes were above it, 50% of the crimes were below it. When you look at that, it's dropping off from more serious offenses to this straight line out at the end is the level of a misdemeanor, okay? So are these kids getting arrested? Absolutely. 74% of them get rearrested. Are they getting arrested less, given the time on the street? Yes. Are they getting arrested for less serious things? Yes, okay? And when you look at self-reports, we ask them about self-reports, and what we find are, are distinct subgroups in there and those groups, most of them report very little self-report offending. There's about a 10% a group that really report high. We have given 22 things, and did you do this or didn't you do it? And this says about five of them. So did you carjack anybody? Yes. Did you beat anybody up so they had to go to the hospital? Yes. Did you sell any drugs? Yes. Did you? Okay. They get five of those of 22. They're pretty actively, they're criminally active. What's interesting is this other group, this 21%, twice the size, is going from that same level of offending down to about zero over the same time period. So most of the kids aren't reporting doing much, and yet uh, a lot of the, the uh, a small number of the kids are reporting continued serious offending. And the, these map onto the arrest data very neatly. Okay. 
I just want to emphasize another finding we keep coming across, and that is alcohol. We can't get rid of the a relationship of alcohol. This just shows, and, and other drug use, I say alcohol and, and substance use in general. These kids have a, a high proportion of subs diagnosable substance use problems, and at each time point, if you take the low end of, of a drug or alcohol use and the high end, and you just split the sample and look at the number of arrests in each group, this pattern continues out for seven years. Every time they're doing more drugs, they're doing more arrests, okay? And that's really consistent. So then we look at them later and we say, well, they're kind of, then we look at them at 23. We say, okay, well, what happened by the time they turned 23? What do they look like? And the thing is, they're same and different in early adulthood. The left bars show uh, the, the proportion of the sample who were, let's say, employed part-time or full-time, that's like 20 hours a week at the outset of the study, and the yellow bars is where they were at age 23 at the end of the study, okay? And you can see about the same number of kids are employed, and some of, them, some of these are totally predictable. You know, how many got education, uh, got a GED or a high school degree, uh, how many have a stable residence, more access to the community, meaning they were locked up less uh, during that, that last year than they were during the first year, and how many have a singular romantic relationship during that time. So some of these are very predictable. Um, what's interesting about these is that we, we then try to put them together in a latent class analysis where we basically say, so what hangs together? What, what, what groups, if you could divide them into groups, are there any groups that are kind of looking the same? And we have four, four groups which you can read up there, uh, basically th th that split out. What's interesting about these is that across the, the loadings, um, education and parenthood don't really, they just load pretty consistently across. It's almost, I mean, we didn't, they're not random across there, but they don't differentiate the groups of kids terribly well. A whole lot of the kids have education and they're still, you know, doing nothing or, or, or some, you know, hanging out of the house. And a whole lot of kids have a high school degree and they're doing much better. So th the education variable and the parenthood variable just don't seem to differentiate the groups very much at all here at age 23. And, but part of it is then if you look at the level of parenthood, it's rather high. This is by age, the number of kids in the sample, males, males on the left, females on the right, who report either b having a biological child they're responsible for or parenting a child, being with somebody and having to be a, in a parent role in the house. Uh, and I, I think that the standard data is, is somewhere around 30%. I think the ad health data is about 30% parenthood at uh, at between 18 and, and 23, and we're a multiple of that uh, in this group. So, so these kids have kids and, and at a reasonably high rate, okay? So the last thing I want to mention is institutional care is a developmental influence. These kids go in and out of institutions. 87% of them ended up in an institutional placement. And if you look at the number of unique stays, meaning time periods they were in, it's 2.4 for juveniles, 4.9 for adults. And, and uh, for unique facilities, meaning different places they've been in, you know, two and, and four. Now what that translates into is if you look at individual profiles like this one, this is an individual who uh, uh, you can see on the left side is, it tells you where they were during that month and the 84 months are along the bottom. This individual is in a juvenile facility, went out, was in the community for a while, went back to a, uh, a juvenile facility, then went to an adult setting, then came back to a juvenile setting, then was in the community, right, and then adult, you know, that's about average. When I, when I just showed you the two and the four, and that's like two and four, right, of the stays and, and, and the movements in and out. There are other kids that look like this, okay? One short, a bunch of jail stays uh, in, in the back, but no, no future arrests, no more arrests. Probably probation violations. These are probably all parole and probation violations, okay? So the complexity of these kids' lives in terms of institutional care is a little overwhelming when you start to just kind of look at it figuratively. And then you say, well, if they're back in, are they getting services? The first thing we notice is substance use problems, high rate of diagnosable problems, are they getting services in the community? If you take just the kids that have the diagnosable substance use problems and look, did they get services for substance use services in the community over those seven years, what you find is they're getting most of their services when they get them in adult settings and in juvenile settings. And over here, only 30% of them are getting, over seven years, reaching a clinically diagnosable substance use disorder problem at age 16 on average, only 30% of them are ever getting substance use services in the community. Now, and they're getting them one every 47 days, which means they probably went to 
you know, a, a ref an evaluation or a group or something, you know, every once in a while, all right? So the level of services for specified, identifiable, clinically relevant problems is, is very low in this group. And these kids are, are kids that we know the substance use is related to offending, <laughs> okay? This isn't just, you know, anybody with a substance use problem. These are kids who are in the system, have done a felony, we know their substance use is related to offending, and 30% of them ever get a substance use service in the community, okay? So into the, the, the things I want to come away with is the, the path in the adult criminal justice system. Juveniles do go to the adult system, but it's not real uniform. 71% uh, of the pathway sample had to stay in an adult facility, but if you, if you just run the analysis, staying in a juvenile facility doesn't mean you're going to stay in an adult facility. It's not terribly predictive. These kids move in and out of these facilities. They may be in an adult facility, but they weren't placed in a, in a juvenile facility necessarily. This is not a homogeneous set of kids who all move along the same path. They go out and they come in. 32% of this group that we're talking about ended up in a uh, prison facility by age 24, okay? Sizable, but not, not the whole group. And uh, there's a large amount of in-system transition occurs at the level of jail and probation. That's a lot of what's happening to these kids as they move through the system. So if, if I walk away with that, then I say the challenge is dealing with recurrent re-entry into the community as a young adult. What it is is it's a set of experiences that they're having. Not, they're, not a, they're not a distinct class of real different individuals. They're going through a whole set of experiences during this time period, and yet, we, we very, have very low level of services for these kids. These are the kids that most people don't want in their services. You know, they, they really don't want to pick them up. If they don't come back, that's probably pretty good. So they're, they're reasonably happy about that. So a couple issues to consider. It is, um, there's considerable variability. I just want to emphasize that, that this, the idea that we're even talking about adolescents in the juvenile and adult system as if they're a distinct, identifiable class uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of pushing against that. I'm saying that they're really, what's happening is a series of events that, are, that have to do with involvement in the system. And we have a strange distinction between 18, and we've gone over this enough, so we, I don't think we have to discuss this again, but the juvenile system very clearly shows uh, in locales where we, that, that's a very hard line uh, service provision really drops off. So if the 30% look low, if you're getting it at 17, there's no guarantee you're ever gonna get it at 18 or 19. Um, substance use and substance use problems play an enduring role. We've tested substance use every way we can do it, and it just keeps coming out. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very strong relationship, lagged relationship, concurrent relationship. You know, every, every time we look at it, the substance use is there. And family involvement is an ex unexplored asset. People have mentioned this, but in this group as well, a lot of these kids, these kids aren't going, like the foster care kids, they're not going out into a vacuum somewhere. They're going home. When, when these kids leave institutions, 80% of them go home to a biological mother. Okay, so, so the families, and yet in this, in this system, the families really, the, the idea of family involvement is we don't want to help the well-being with your children. You walk in and you say you want to talk about your kid, and they say, well, what did you do? You know, you, you got him here. Yeah, this is your problem. So the, the, this is like the last frontier of family involvement out here, all right? But, and yet it's totally unexplored asset, and they're having kids. So they have kids, and they're still connected to their families. So why we're not figuring that one out more, I don't know. Uh, institutional environments matter. Uh, we got to know what the effects of these institutional stays are, and it seems that continuity of care is a major unaddressed issue here. The last thing I just want to mention is that if you think of these kids going through these trajectories of, of getting insufficient skills necessarily to take on the next set of challenges and not getting services that they're necessarily uh, needing, when, you, when they, pay, they, they pay a year and a half or two years in jail time or something, they're paying in like a different currency than an adult, you know? It's like two years, two years from 18 to 20 isn't the same as two years from 34 to 36, okay? And, and that's, that's something that I think the system just hasn't recognized at all, and yet that's, that's really very clear when you see these kids' lives, when you see them unfolding, that th these two or two you're not gonna get back. So uh, that's where we're at, thanks.